Welcome to the Insider at Heritage Museums and Gardens, where every other week we chat with guests and museum staff about all the exciting things that are happening in season here at the museum. This year, the museum is celebrating its 50th anniversary, so please plan to join us. My name is Judith Getz, and I'm happy to be your host today. In this episode, we're speaking with Heritage's assistant curator, Amanda Wastrom, on our 50 for 50 exhibit. We start this interview by examining some of the items currently installed in our special exhibits gallery. So the first edition of Tom Sawyer, um, one of Mr. Lilly's most significant parts of his rare book collection was his Mark Twain collection. And this this particular volume has all the hallmarks of the way that he collected. It is an excellent example. It is in wonderful shape. It is signed by Mark Twain, which for book collectors and rare book collectors is a really important piece. If you can get it, that's, a, that's great. And um, this particular piece, one additional facet to the 50 for 50 exhibition was that we asked people who either had a connection to the objects or, or the lilies or the museum heritage itself to select item, the items for us. So this item was selected by Joel Silver, who's the director of the Lilly Library, and um, his comments on it, he felt that this particular volume really encapsulated, you know, the, the sort of, is a highlight of the collection and, and tells you a lot about who Mr. Lilly was as a collector. Like I said, he was very, you know, he was picky. He didn't just collect everything, he, he picked out and tried to get the best things that he could. So he had certain parameters around the items that he would pick. Mm-hmm. So as we look around, um, we immediately encounter um, a very beautiful boat, <laughs> <laughs> wooden boat, um, extravagant uh, in its elegance and detail. Yeah, so uh, the lilies moved to the Cape in the 1920s, I think they finally purchased a house in the 1930s, and J.K. Lilly Jr. loved loved the sea, he loved to sail, he loved maritime history, and so he had a collection of these ship models built, um, and they were uh, all included in his house that he lived in down in Quisset in Woods Hole. And this particular one is called the Frigate Alliance, and the boat itself has a really interesting history um, going back to the Revolutionary War. This, what's also nice about this one is it uh, was constructed by Robert Innes, who was a local um, ship model builder. He lived in South Dennis, Massachusetts, um, and this was built around 1940 to 1950, but was actually... Um, he is considered one of the great sort of master boat builders, or ship, ship model builders, I should say. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. And um, as you're, you kind of tilt over to the left, there's a beautiful version that is completely encased in silver. <laughs> yes, so, and that one has like, an entirely different story. So that one, we're kind of jumping forward in time, and that, this one is, we call it the silver ship. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we refer to it, um, but it does have a title. It's the America II, mm-hmm. and this piece was commissioned by J.K. Lilly Jr. III. So we're talking about the son now, the man who founded Heritage, and um, he used to work with Shreve Crump and Low here in in America. But it was commissioned by them um, from a uh, silversmith in London, and um, it's. A model, again, a ship model of the America II, entirely made out of sterling silver. And to describe it on radio, it's about three and a half to four feet tall, I would say, mm-hmm. and about three feet wide. And a little on the high side. <laughs> it is heavy. It takes more than one person to move it, and it is impeccable. Uh, same thing in its detail. Only this time, everything is made out of silver instead of wood. So the ropes and the pulleys and all the rigging. And, um, everything is made out of silver. The fun fact about this one, too, uh-huh. is that so the America one, the original America ship, was the one that won the race in, the 18, in 1851 that was eventually called the America's Cup. And that was the ship that Mr. Lilly originally asked for. But the model that he got was, <laughs> was the America, America too. <laughs> so they actually 
built the wrong, the wrong, technically the wrong ship, but this is not something that you return. <laughs> no, well, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's absolutely spectacular. And uh, this is definitely a visitor favorite. That whenever we have it out, visitors love it. And um, so, people who, again, we have, you know, visitors who've been coming to Heritage for many, many years mm -hmm. will hopefully enjoy seeing it back out again. Now, in this room, um, I, I have to say that one of the things that captivated me the most throughout the entire exhibit, and I don't know why, maybe it's a child in me, but <laughs> um, I absolutely love the uh, Humpty Dumpty Circus. And I know that, uh, of course, we do have at uh, some juncture in the next couple of years, we will have an um, exhibit that's entirely dedicated to the toy collection. But this particular piece is, um, I don't know, it's charming. There's something about it that's mm -hmm. just... Uh, old and and I can see how you know it would still be able to be used today. Um, but why was this placed in the exhibit? So um, we have a really wonderful collection of antique toys, mm -hmm. and with our younger visitors too, I think they're really wonderful to captivate their attention. But I, I mean, I think younger visitors, young at heart, I mean, you can't help but look at this piece and smile. And so. Again, what we tried to do with the 50 objects was kind of represent our areas of strength and sort of our, our signature collections, and, and our toy collection is definitely one of them. And, and this particular um, toy, the Humpty Dumpty Circus, it's called, was, is definitely a highlight of the collection. Um, it was a really popular toy. It was made for, I think, 40 years and it was, a, it was a set, but you didn't have to buy it as a set. You'd, you'd get the pieces, and then you could add different animals to it. There's 37 different animals that you could get. And so we have a sort of sampling of them. Our curator, Jennifer Madden, in the researching this recently has discovered that I guess a lot of the other pieces, the remaining pieces, are on eBay. So oh, you're kidding. <laughs> We are hoping that maybe we can expand the, the figures that we own to not just be these. But the so maybe the early version of the Fisher Price Little People. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's one of the first play sets basically. Yep. And you can think of anything from Legos to Playmobil to uh -huh. um, the Fisher Price figures. As this is a um, early uh, early twentieth century, excuse me, version of it, and it's got the circus tent. Um, it's got a base, it's got and all these different animals and figures and props that you could get. The, the animals all move, too. So um, the elephant's trunk moves, and the arms move, and the legs move. So you can make the animals do lots of different things. So really great for open-ended play. Now, as we look over to the side, I want to make mention of uh, something that you hear with frequency from visitors about wanting to see the miniature soldiers. And uh, you've got a huge display of them out this year. Tell me a little bit about why this was significant. And tell me a little bit about the creation of the collection itself, because that's slightly unusual as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the military miniatures are another crowd favorite. And for those who remember this building when it was the American History Museum, remember the military miniatures. They many, We have over 6,000 of them in the collection. And... Many more of them are tip, were typically on display when this building was entirely dedicated to the military collection. Um, when this building was converted to a sort of temporary exhibit space, we've been limited to how many we've been able to display at any given time. And so visitors have, been, have often asked, where are the military miniatures? Where are the military? So, um, so we thought that it would be fun to get them out. So this year we have about over around a thousand of them on display. So again, only a fraction of the over 6,000 that we have, but, um, but a lot, a lot more than we've had recently. <laughs> and we put them on display in, in a nice big case with their own lights that I think works really nicely for you to really dive in and check them out. And so the, the history of this part these particular items was, again, going back to J.K. Lilly Jr., the father, very interested in history, very interested in military history, American and American history. And um, he had seen military miniatures in Europe. That's, and these are not, they, they look like toy soldiers, but they're not actually toys. These are items that were made, again, in, particularly initially in Europe, that were used to study military history. 
So they were very historically accurate to whatever particular regiments or battles or moment in military history they were referring to. And he noticed that these did not exist in America for any kind of you know, American military history. So he commissioned two toy makers um, that actually lived in uh, Delaware and commissioned them to make these particular soldiers. And it was a multi-year project for these toy makers. They were husband and wife. And they were, they're handmade, they're made out of lead, and they're hand painted. So they're, you know, each unit is, again, they did tons of historical research before they created them to make sure they had their uniforms just right for whatever the, the particular display was, whether it was their dress uniform or what. Um, they all have crazy hats, and some of them have backpacks, and some of them are cavalry units or artillery units with little miniature cannons. Um, my favorite part, <laughs> yes, yes, there's um, some band units as well. <laughs> yeah. no, no. But one of my favorite parts are the flags. Um, mm -hmm. So the flags are hand painted, and I mean, they're really delightful. I mean, there's a flag right here that's got a portrait of George Washington on it. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy seeing the, the Don't Tread on Me flag from um, the Revolutionary War era. I mean, <laughs> I had not spent a, whole, spent a whole lot of time with this collection before this exhibit, so it was a great opportunity to kind of dive deep and, and get lost in them, and I think they're really fun. Yeah, there's even the, uh, well, you see different things, and some of them will be reminiscent, of course, of uh, what you would expect to see in European mm -hmm. battles. Yeah, um, and, and so they're, they're all American, and they date basically from the 1600s up past the Civil War-ish. It's not, it's not a comprehensive, collection, but um, but it's fairly complete. <laughs> There's a lot. A lot going on. So, yes. And uh, right behind it, you actually have a battle rail mm -hmm. that is uh, the surrender of Yorktown from 18, uh, or excuse me, 1781. Um, and it's eye level, so you can actually kind of uh, look at it or the toy soldiers in a different way. Yes, so another part of the Military Ministers collection, we have about six different dioramas from um, that sort of capture particular battles and events in American military history. So this particular one, like you said, is the surrender at Yorktown, part of the Revolutionary War. It was selected by George Lilly, who was, is, sorry, is one of J.K. Lilly Jr.'s, uh, J.K. Lilly III's son, so he was J.K. Lilly Jr.'s grandson, um, and I, I, he actually has some wonderful memories of being in that hobby house in his private museum and, and playing in there with him. And, and um, he also felt it was important to bring this piece out as his choice because both J.K. Lilly Jr. and J.K. Lilly III were, were, again, very interested in military history, but also very supportive and cared a lot about veterans, and, and so he wanted to make sure that that was sort of front and center, or at least an important part of the exhibit. What's wonderful about the piece is just, again, how historically accurate it is, and so the more you learn about the surrender of Yorktown and, and how the event went down, the more you can actually piece together what's going on in the different parts of the diorama. Like, oh, here's George Washington over here, and here are the, you know, the British soldiers. They had to, you know, surrender their weapons, and then they're standing over here. And, um, so the the more you know, the more you can really delve into the details that that they capture here. That's true. And in the room itself, on this side of the room, at any rate, we have. Um, Something, uh, it's uh, obviously a small, looks like a doll bed. <laughs> We're looking at it, looks like ivory as well. And it's actually special. And you have various samples of this and something that kind of looks like an accordion, and I know that that's been a trivial question in the past. <laughs> or at least used as one. Tell me about the items that are here in the Scrimshaw section. Sure, so the Scrimshaw collection is another one of our a, you know, a highlight of our objects, and we, you know, at this point in the museum's history, we are interested in also, you know, collecting and highlighting um, 
local. We have a lot of folk art in our collection. That's also a highlight, but specifically local folk art traditions. And that's what's great about Scrimshaw. It's got a really direct connection to Cape Cod and southeastern Massachusetts. It was um, what's classified as Scrimshaw is anything that was created by whalemen um, during their whaling voyages, which would have been any time from you know, 1830s, 40s, up through 1850s, 60s is basically generally the, the ballpark of what we're doing. So these whaling voyages were about four years long. Um, there was a lot of downtime for the sailors, and there was a lot of whalebone around. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's really fascinating to see what, what the sailors created. And some of them were really real artists in what they did. Um, some of the objects in here, we have a really elaborate pie crimper. And, I mean, the, the story goes that at one point on the island of Nantucket, which was really a hub of whaling, it was like every woman on Nantucket had their own little ivory, scrimshaw ivory <laughs> pie crimper that was completely elaborate. And the, the funny thing about this one is when you look at it, you can't quite figure out if someone could actually use it, <laughs> is it actually functional, or would those other tools that are added on yeah. and the act, extra added sort of flounces and decorative details would have probably just gotten in the way yeah, of no, your pie absolutely. making? Absolutely. Um, yeah, you kind of have to. Unfortunately, it's not uh, something that you can easily describe. It's right. Like you actually have to visually see. Yeah. It. <laughs> um, but the accordion item that you were referring to is a winding swift and um, another. Fairly common item, I would say, that you know any any small museum on Cape Cod who's got some scrimshaw probably has a swift, mm -hmm. and it was basically used to wind yarn. So um, after you were spinning your yarn on your spinning wheel, you would have these huge sort of skeins of it, but it wasn't in a ball that you could use. You know, it was these big sort of loops of yarn. So the winding swift, you would take those loops, you would put them over the accordion area. You could stretch it. To depending on the size of your loops, and then it would spin, you could spin it into a little ball that, so that you could actually knit or... So very useful. And some are decorative yeah. and some are actually useful, and the doll's bed is self-explanatory, I guess yes. you could say. Yeah. Um, and I think the highlights of these is they're, they're functional, but the decoration on them is really what sort of elevates them. I mean, we probably have at least 10 Swifts in our collection, but what really brings this one out is not it a great example is just all the decorative additions to it and the different colors that are included there and the, the condition that it's in. Well, the condition in particular, I mean, it is such a fragile looking piece and it is an exquisite shape yeah. considering uh, its age. Yeah. So you had mentioned the folk art collection, which is something that you can kind of uh, take a gander at if you're um, immediately pivoting to the left. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I've seen a lot of samples of over in the Heritage Collection, which is uh, hosted over in the Carousel Building, and that is typically where we place uh, most of Heritage's items on display. Tell me a little bit about the fine uh, folk art, art that is on the wall, and why uh, you'll see that they, the figures in particular look somewhat disfigured. They're not, <laughs> they're not, I mean, if you take a close look, it looks like somebody, but there is a terrific amount of... Uh, Exactly. Disfigurement, yeah, yeah. exaggeration. <laughs> and uh, well, I was wondering if you could go ahead and explain um, exactly why that is. What are we looking at when we're looking at folk art? Sure, so these two portraits, they're folk, American folk art portraits, early American, um, I believe they're from the 1800s, let me just double check the dates. Yeah, so early to mid 1800s and what I think is nice about the pair, we had, we had several in our collection that we offered for people to select and, and we had two selectors choose these ones in particular and as a pair I think they speak to each other really nicely because there's sort of a wide range in um, skill level or approach and um, typically folk art portraits were done by itinerant painters, so painters who would just sort of pass through your town, they would come with their canvases, and you could have a portrait of someone yourself or someone in your family done, and depending on how much you could pay, <laughs> would determine how much detail you could include. So, you know, whether it was just your head or um, your full body, your arms and legs, and actually that's where the uh, phrase, it cost me an arm and a leg comes from, was every additional limb or hands would be extra. <laughs> oh, see, now I just learned something too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
So the one on the right here, the portrait of Marie, Mary Louisa Bird, we don't actually know who the artist is, but we're guessing it was more of an itinerant style painter, so that is exactly what I was describing, that they would stop in town and, and you know, people would pay to have their portraits painted. What's really extraordinary about this particular one is just the amount of detail that's included here. Um, her dress is completely extravagant, this beautiful purple dress, and she's got a really elaborate handbag there, and the, the lace on her um, pant, pantaloons or whatever, the mm -hmm. <laughs> undergarments, and, and even the background. And it doesn't totally make sense. She kind of looks like she's floating a little bit. And the, the sort a very of small body, body yeah. compared to the head. Yeah. So these painters were typically not traditionally schooled. They never went to art school. They they didn't study under anyone. So they're sort of sorting out proportions and the way that they paint all on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the time, the fa the faces are the most nicely resolved. And I think that's the case here as well. Is that the face, you can tell that the person, the painter spent a lot of time on the face and all the beautiful details of the face. Yeah, her eyes are beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and they seem to be saying a lot without yeah. saying much. Mm -hmm. And of course, right and next, then, we've uh, got a, a, what seems like a very young child with a toy and uh, a pet dog. And I think most can identify with the dog holding the leash. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. That's right. So this one's titled Boy in a Red Dress with Dog by William Matthew Pryor. And, and so William Matthew Pryor is a, a different example, which again is why I think they make a nice pair. So he was very well known at the time, and he had his own studio in Boston. And so people would actually come to him instead of you know, him having to travel around. And, and so he was much more popular, more trained, and um, sort of a more, I think, resolved look. I think the dress sometimes throws people off, but at that time, um, boys did wear dresses. Yeah, fairly <laughs> customary, yeah. yeah. Right, well, we have um, touched on a variety of different pieces that you can see right here in the SCG building. Um, as you had mentioned, there are pieces that are scattered throughout the grounds that are part of this 50 for 50 exhibit. Again, you had mentioned there are a couple of classic cars, there are some plants. Um, anything else I'm saying? The flume. The flume. The carousel, of course. Yes. Yeah, don't forget the carousel. There's one item up in, in the art building as well, and then Hidden Hollow was also had felt like it had to, well, didn't felt, it wasn't my decision actually. That was our crowd favorite pick. We did a, a survey of our visitors and um, to include whatever their favorite item is. So, so one of the things that uh, you've given people the opportunity to do is pick up a map up at the um, ticket area and it's kind of a scavenger hunt of sorts. So you'll be able to follow that along and see the different pieces that have been picked and then learn a little bit more about why they were picked. One other thing I want to mention in regards to this exhibit as well is that um, you have an entire wall that's got some blank frames on that. And it's uh, kind of the last part of the exhibit, the in interactive piece, if you will. Just tell me a little bit about what that is and how you'd like people to participate. So the overall structure of the exhibit is a little bit like a house. You, there's different rooms that you can walk through. And ideally, it's also arranged chronologically. So uh, visitors will come in, learn sort of the foundations of the museum, learn how, when the museum was started, what was going on then. And so by the end, hopefully by the end, in the last room you get to, you're, you've gone up to the present day, and then we're looking forward to the future. And so thinking about the future, we thought it would be interesting. You know, uh, the future in a way is a big empty frame. You know, what, what are we going to put inside those frames? And, and I think we do try to incorporate our visitors into everything we do. They're, they're the reason why we're here. So getting their input and just seeing what do you see as the future of heritage? What, what, what do you want us to do? What, what do you want us to collect or show or you know, whatever that sort of prompt means to them? I think for kids, it can also be a fun excuse to draw yeah. <laughs> while, while, while the adults are, are busy looking no, at the like at other things. Look at. <laughs> so if you'd like more information about uh, the exhibit or other things that are going on at Heritage, we encourage you to go to our website, which is heritagemuseums.org. Um, this exhibit will go on from Monday, October 14th, and so you can join us anytime between now and then. Um, so thank you so much.
been wonderful. I'm learning a little bit more about this exhibit. Um, of course, uh, Amanda's been joining us for the latest episode of Inside Our Heritage Museums and Gardens. Uh, Amanda Wastrom, our assistant curator here at Heritage, and uh, she's worked extensively on this main exhibit, which is 5250. Today's interview has been brought to you by our Bull Insurance Foundation and Cape Cod 5, our 2019 season sponsors. Of course, you can hear more interviews like this one by finding us on iTunes. And more information about Heritage Museums and Gardens and upcoming programming, as we mentioned, can all be found on our website at heritagemuseums.org. Until next time, thank you so much for listening.